Amen. We had a, we had that's why we're doing it again this year because we had a wonderful time at Red Clay Resort last year. It's kind of a very unique place. Uh, it's not exactly a secret to people that live in Cleveland, yet probably 50, 60, maybe even 70% of people that live in Cleveland don't know it exists because if you, if you ever see pictures of it, you go, where's that at? And they go, from Cleveland. They go, Cleveland? Where? I never... Yeah, people everywhere out there, and it's, uh, it's uh, like I said, it's quite a unique place, very beautiful place, really, you know, because the, the water is some kind of spring-fed, and it looks like, a, you know, the, the water is, what, four or five times bigger than the sanatorium, maybe maybe six, eight times bigger, and just beautiful, clear, and, of course, the picnic area. You don't have to get in the water, but, you know, there's picnic areas, and, and uh, we have a pavilion rented, and uh, uh, don't get there early, like John said, but but keep in mind, you know, it's, it's, it's on the outskirts of Cleveland, but it's as far as you can go in Bradley County that way. So it's 18, 20 minutes from right here. So if you live, you know, like from my house, you got to add another 10 minutes. So allow for that. And uh, man, oh man, nothing like, and, and these hamburgers, they're always, our hamburgers are charcoal. No? No. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, I mean, oh, okay. No, they're not cooked over charcoal, okay. Yeah, I like them the other way too. They're both good. Anyway, <laughs> oh well. <laughs> Amen. Praise God. Hallelujah. These hamburgers come from Japan. <laughs> no, Amen. Boy, I'm excited about the word tonight. Amen. Glory to God. You could go ahead and, and look up Isaiah chapter 59. And uh, Sunday morning, we started a message, and I thought it was just going to be one message, but I want to do some more on it, that, that I called uh, uh, three big, what I call it, blessing blockers. Three big blessing blockers. blockers. So today, you know, this is going to, I'm going to continue along those same lines. I want to reiterate and add to some of the things that we said, and then I want to give you another one. So my, my official title tonight is More Blessing Block Blockers. But, but, but I want to emphasize some things about the first three and then, and then uh, give you a little more about that all the way around. Glory to God. Uh, glory to God. Hallelujah. Because these, these things will stop or block the blessings of God from being manifested in our life. Hallelujah. And of course, ultimately, the reason we're teaching on this is by knowing what these blessing blockers are, we can, number one, avoid them, or number two, if they're, if they're operating in our life, we can remove them from our lives so that we can receive all the blessings that God has for us. Amen. God wants us to be blessed. And of course, once we're blessed, then we can go out and be a blessing to others and be useful and productive in the kingdom of God. Can you say amen? And so the first thing we said Sunday morning is this. We said the first big blessing blocker is sin. Sin. Psalm 66, 18 says, If I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear. Of course, the, the expression, the Lord will not hear, or his ears are open to your prayers, or his eyes are open or closed to your prayers, all has reference to if God, if his ears are open to you, if he hears your prayer, then he answers them. Praise God. But this says, if I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear. Now the Amplified Bible says, New Amplified says, if I regard sin in my heart, that is, listen carefully now, if I know that it's there and do nothing about it. If I know that it's there and do nothing, we're not talking about people that make a mistake and ask God to forgive them. We're not even talking about people that struggle to overcome some sin. They don't fall into this category. We're talking about somebody that has sin in their life, disobedience in their life. They know it's there and they just harden their heart and they continue to, or they just ignore it. They continue to live in it. And he says, that is, if I know there is, that it's there and do nothing about it, the Lord will not hear me. Rick Renner says that this, this expression regarding iniquity in my heart means if I deliberately purpose to commit sin again and again, or if you have some sin that you're not willing to abandon, whether that's unforgiveness or hatred or temptation you're meditating on again and again, and you hold it in your heart and choose not to do anything about it, then God will not hear your prayers. And so it's very important because the devil wants to jump on people with both feet and condemn them that you understand we're not talking about past failures and past sins. Those things are under the blood. We're not talking about people that sometimes struggle with some sin. Uh, but you see, these people, they, they may struggle with it, but they don't accept it. They don't justify it. They don't ignore it. They repent when they fall, when they fail. They may fa fail repeatedly, but they are learning to walk out their deliverance. They're learning to walk in the freedom that Jesus Christ made available to them through the cross. Can you say amen? 
But, you see, people who refuse to repent, who ignore God's dealing with them about some sin, and who continue to practice some sin without any remorse, will get in trouble sooner or later. And that's the problem, that, that sometimes it is later, so they think, well, you know, I don't care what you preachers are saying. I've been living this way for months or weeks or years, and it's not costing me. But sooner or later, sooner or later, if you get from, out, out from under God's umbrella of protection, you certainly open yourself up to the devil to attack you. And, of course, the only reason he comes is to steal, kill, and destroy, and you actually block the power of God from operating in your life. Can you say amen? Now, Proverbs 29, 13, you don't have to turn there because we read this already. It says, he who covers his sins will not prosper, but he who confesses and forsakes, and the word forsakes there means turns away from, renounces, repents of. So if you're repentant about it, you don't fall in this category. Then you, you can go to find mercy. But he who covers his sins will not prosper. But when you forsake them and turn from them and repent of them and renounce them, then you will have mercy. 1 Corinthians 11.31 in the New Testament, Paul said, writing to Christians, if we would judge ourselves, what does it mean, judge yourself? Well, that means say, well, I, I shouldn't have talked that way to my wife. I, I shouldn't have, the, the Lord has revealed to me that I have a sorry work ethic, that I, I don't respect those in authority over me. I don't respect authority. And, you know, I, I, the Holy Ghost is dealing with me about that. And so you, you say, Lord, that, that's wrong. I judge myself and you repent of it. Amen. Or, but if you just say, ah, oh, well, I don't care. That's just the way I am. And we don't put up with that stuff, you know. No, that's not judging yourself. If the Lord's dealing with you about anything or you see it in the word of God and then you say, well, that, that, you face up to it and admit it's wrong and repent of it, then we will not be judged. Can you say amen? And so Isaiah 59, here's a scripture we didn't look at. Amen. Uh, but th this is an interesting one, strong one. Isaiah 59, verses 1 and 2. Isaiah 59, 1. There it is. It says, Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened. You know, a shortened hand means he can't help you. But the Lord's hand is not shortened that he cannot save, he cannot heal, he cannot deliver, nor his ear heavy that he cannot hear. But your iniquities have separated you from your God and your sins, and your sins have hidden his face from you. Well, if his face is hidden from you, then, then, then you know, then the blessings are blocked. Amen. So some people say, some people that I love and respect and just have a little bit of different opinion, I guess, but some ministers say, well, under the New Testament, our sins never stand in the way of God hearing us and answering our prayers. Our sins, because you know, Jesus died on the cross for our sins. Our sins never stand in the way of God blessing us or never cause us to re get, result in any kind of judgment because God doesn't judge Christians under the New Testament. Well, I think Ananias and Sapphira might disagree with your doctrine. <laughs> might say, uh, I got a little bit different take on that. But you see, I know one man that's well-respected, well-known. I love him. I appreciate him. Read after him a lot. Uh, he says Ananias and Sapphira weren't Christians because he just cannot accept that they, any Christian under the New Testament would ever have any kind of judgment fall on them. Well, I, I cannot accept that Ananias and Sapphira are not Christians. That seems ludicrous to me, you see. So if my doctrine's wrong, then I got to change my doctrine to line up with the Word of God. Somewhere along the line, I'm not thinking right. So, so, so you know, and, and, and so, but they say sin, but, but at the same time, this person will very strongly tell you sin will hurt you because it gives Satan access into your life. But it's never because God won't hear you and prosper you. Well, if the sin causes God to not be able to heal me, to help me and prosper me, then, it, then it's blocking the blessings, isn't it? Amen. Praise God. Either way, it, it keeps you from receiving God's blessing and results in you not being able to overcome the devil's attacks. And the New Testament does say, amen, that Ananias and Sapphira were judged because of sin. Jesus told Christians, because you know, there's a group of people that say, well, because our sins have been dealt with past, present, and future, then really you don't even ever have to repent or confess your sin. That's not really necessary. You know, uh, I think 1 John 1, 9 might disagree with them. Amen. But uh, that's not really necessary. Listen, the grace of God in what Jesus did for us on the cross for the Christian makes repentance. It doesn't make repentance unnecessary. It makes it possible. That's right. Makes it possible. Glory to God. So Jesus told Christ, Jesus, everybody say Jesus. Jesus. 
I mean, think about some very famous people that tell you it's not, not necessary for Christians to repent, or that's even a wrong doctrine. Jesus, in the book of Revelation, writing to churches, the seven churches, and I forget now, but it's like five out of those seven churches, he told the believers in those churches to repent. Well, Jesus seemed to think that sometimes Christians needed to repent. And then in 1 John 1, 9, tells Christians, no, absolutely no doubt about it, he's talking to Christians, to confess their sins. And if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us. 1 Corinthians eleven thirty one, 31, as we, we mentioned, tells Christians that, that they can uh, eventually fall into judgment if they don't judge themselves. Again, another very famous Christ, uh, Christian author says, well, the, the, this isn't talking to Christians. These are people that slipped into their communion services that are not Christians. Really? No, Jesus said, Jesus said, and then Jesus also said, God won't hear your prayers if you have unforgiveness in your heart against others. Peter said in 1 Peter 3, 8 through 12, if you speak evil against others, badmouth them and criticize them, critical of them, unkind toward them, that God won't hear your prayers. In 1 Peter 3, 7, Peter said to husbands, Christ, Christian husbands, if you don't treat your wife right, your prayers will be hindered. You know, if you're hindered, that means you can't get there. They're stopped. 1 Peter 4.15, Peter says, it's possible to suffer as a Christian because of doing evil. He says, don't suffer as a Christian because of being an evildoer or doing evil, or because you're a busybody in other people's matters. He also says not being a, a murderer, but, you know, murderer and busybody, right there in the same scripture. <laughs> Don't suffer. In other words, it's possible to suffer even as a Christian because of doing evil. Amen. Well, to me, and, and that's not all the scriptures along these lines. That is not all the scriptures along these lines. That's just too many scriptures to try to explain away. Don't you think? Amen. Just because you believe that a Christian's sin will not block you from experiencing God's blessings or hinder your faith and prayers from not working. Now listen, if you walk in love and you never sin, that doesn't mean the blessings of God will be yours. No, you receive the blessings of God by faith. But your faith won't work and your prayers won't work and the power of God won't come on the scene for you to be blessed if you're doing these wrong things. So there are hindrances. Glory to God. All right, let's look at Psalms 107.20, still on the same vein, so you know I hadn't left it. Psalms 107. It's a very beautiful scripture, the one we all love. Psalms 107, verse 20, says, He sent His word and healed them. He sent His word and healed them and delivered them from their destructions. God sent His word to His people. They were saved. They were healed. They were delivered. Aren't you glad for that? God's word is powerful. His words, Jesus said, My words are spirit and life. They're life-giving. God's word of, is full of power to save. It's full of power to deliver. It's full of power to, to, to set the captive free. Amen. Proverbs 4 says his words are medicine and health to all our flesh. And, and his word, by his stripes you were healed, is sent to every believer. Now you know it has to be sent. If it's not sent, then you don't have anything to stand on. Praise God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord Jesus. But, but even though his word is sent and, 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 you know, he sent his word and healed them, doesn't mean it's automatically received. And you know that, you know that, you know, you've heard us say it many times and others, praise God, that we have to receive what God gives. Amen. Faith takes or faith receives what grace gives. By faith, we obtain the promises. Glory to God. Amen. And so, so we have to receive it. But the word has to, it has to be known, it has to be believed, it has to be received by faith. But that doesn't mean that, that sin or unforgiveness or doubt won't stop the power of the word. You follow me? I mean, he sent his word to save the whole world, but the whole world's not saved. Just because, just because, they, because of doubt. Because, you know, for whatever reason they have doubt. Sometimes they just don't know. Sometimes they know and reject it, the word. But you see, it stopped. But he sent his word, it's available to him. So the power of God, he sent his word and healed us. Isn't that powerful? But I want you to see Psalms 107, verse 20. I want you to see this in, in the context in which it was written. So Psalms 107, 
Verse number 4, this is the same chapter, of course, as we've read that verse. says, they, talking about God's people, the children of Israel, they wandered in the wilderness in a desolate way. They found no city to dwell in, hungry and thirsty. Their soul fainted to them. Then they cried out to the Lord in their trouble, and he delivered them from their distresses. He sent his word and delivered them. Amen. Keep that in mind. Now look at verse numbers. Look at verse at number um, uh, ten. Those who sat in darkness and in the shadow of death, bound in afflictions and irons. Now these are people that are not doing good. They're in the shadow of death. They're bound. They're not free. They're 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 they're, they're you know bound in affliction. It said, verse eleven. Why? Because they rebelled against the word of God and despised the counsel of the Most High. Therefore he brought down their heart with labor, that they, they fell down, and there was none to help. Then, then, they cried out to the Lord in their trouble, and he saved them out of their distress. He delivered them out of their distress. In other words, they were in a mess because they sinned, but when they were in, repented and turned to God, then he sent his word and delivered them. Glory to God. Verse 17. Fools, because of their transgressions and because of their iniquities, were afflicted. They're afflicted. They're not doing good. They're bound. They're sick. Their soul abhorred all manner of food. I'm sure if you get really sick, you just don't want to eat. And when people are dying, you know, that's a problem. They, have to, they, they don't want to eat. They abhorred all manner of food. They drew near to the gates of death. Then... They cried out to the Lord in their trouble, and he saved them from their distress. Here it is, verse 20. He sent his word and healed them. You see the context of that? He sent his word and healed them and delivered them from their destructions. And you can go on reading the rest of the chapter. The main point throughout this chapter is God's people are in trouble. In this case, not in every case, that's not true of everybody, but in this case, God's people are in trouble because of their sins, but when they repent and turn to God, God sends his word and heals them and delivers them and sets them free. But their sin did block the power of God from reaching them. Now listen, listen, because you've got to balance this. Just because somebody is facing a test or trial or, or, or some sickness does not, does not, does not, does not mean it's because they've sinned. How many of you know that's so? Jesus and the, the disciples were persecuted. I mean, every other page, people are attacking Jesus. And Jesus is going through a, you know, some kind of persecution. And on more than one occasion, they faced life-threatening storms. You know, we talk about storms of life. Well, there's literal storms. We see the problems they cause, you know, tornadoes and hurricanes and floods and heavy rains and so forth. But, but then again, storms of life, I mean storms, these natural storms represent the storms of life that we all face. And Jesus said, in this world, see, in this fallen world, where, where, where Satan is the God of these world systems, where there's, there, there's germs in the air and sickness and disease and thorns and wild beasts and all kinds of, in this world you shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer, I've overcome the world. Amen. So Jesus and his disciples were persecuted. They faced life-threatening storms, not because they sinned. They were walking in the perfect will of God. They were doing exactly what Jesus told them to do. You remember he said, go to the other side. That was a command. Jesus, we know, certainly didn't have any sin in his life. But they faced storms of life, amen, uh, that were, that were in this, because they, they, we have an enemy. And the enemy wanted to harm them. He wanted to hurt them. He wanted to kill them. He wanted to destroy them. So Jesus got up and he rebuked the storm. And he rebuked the disciples for their lack of faith. Isn't that right? And so certainly many Christians are defeated in life. But sometimes, but it's not because they've sinned. It's because of a lack of knowledge. It's because they don't, they have, they have a lack of knowledge of the promises of God. They have a lack of knowledge of faith. They don't know how to appropriate by faith that which rightfully belongs to them. They don't know how to receive from God. They don't know how to overcome the problems of faith by using their authority and resisting the devil. That They've never been taught. So we understand that. You're with me, okay? But, everybody say but. Say this is a big but. Why are you smiling? <laughs> But if someone is defeated and can't overcome and obtain their healing 
because of some sin, then the first thing they must do is repent and all their confessions of faith and all their using of the name of Jesus and all their prayers won't help them one iota. What they need to do is repent. And they can repent and be instantly forgiven and instantly receive the power of God to overcome. They need to remove the thing, you see, that's blocking their blessings. Like the disciples face life-threatening storms. And because we live in a fallen world, there are storms, diseases, diseases evil men, problems. Uh, ultimately, it's the devil's fault, you know, but that doesn't mean he's right there trying to put sickness on everybody. Just sickness is in the world because of man's sin and fall and because of Satan. But that we overcome by faith. Glory to God. Thank God for that. Paul faced a life-threatening storm because of the actions and decisions of others. You know the story. You know Paul, they're, they're, they're taking Paul as a prisoner. They're, they're showing him great favor on this particular trip, you know, and he has a lot of freedom and so forth. But nonetheless, he's a prisoner and he has to go where they tell him to go. He, he doesn't make the decisions. And so he's got the, 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 the guard guarding him and they got the, the captain of the ship. And you know the captain of the ship, when you're on the water, he's, 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 he's the man. He's the judge. He's, he's the king. He's the ruler. And so they're deciding whether they should go or not. And Paul said, I perceive... Well, he knew that by the Holy Ghost. He didn't have a vision, didn't have a dream. Jesus didn't specifically say to him, he just had that, that, that's that same leading, that's the way we're all led. Hallelujah. He's had an inner witness, an inner prompting, an inner leading, an inner knowing, a gut feeling. He's, I perceive this voyage will, will come to much harm, including the, uh, you know, the loss of the property on the ship, the ship and our lives themselves will be in danger. But it says, instead of believing Paul, the, the ship's captain and the, the guard that was guarding him decided, no, let's go ahead and sail. Well, you know, they got out there and ran into a, <laughs> a terrible, terrible storm and they lost all the cargo of the ship and the ship eventually went down and sank. But, but, but they all made it safely ashore because of Paul and his prayers. So, so you know, we're all a part of groups. You know, you, you may lose your job because, because your bosses are stupid. I mean, the whole company may close. We, we belong to churches. We, we have families. You know, I've, I, I remember counseling a husband and wife, and the, and the husband was, was made pretty good money and pretty wise with his money, and, and all of a sudden he found out he was in terrible, 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 terrible debt because his wife was a shopaholic. And he didn't, he didn't know it, you know. Then all of a sudden, well, he, he's put in a test or trial because of the decisions of others. Well, how do you overcome those tests and trials? By faith. By faith. Amen. So, there, so Paul found himself in a, it's interesting to me that Paul found himself in a literal storm, not because he was doing anything wrong. The, the disciples found themselves in a literal storm, not because they were doing anything wrong. Paul and the disciples were, were following the perfect plan of God for their lives. But we overcome. Amen. We believe the promises. We use our authority. But now here's this fellow named Jonah. You ever heard of Jonah? I heard an old tape by Brother Hagin. He said, you, you know, like Jonah, I played Whaley. And you're going, what? <laughs> he goes, you don't know what that means, do you? He says, that, in other words, I did something that wasn't very smart. <laughs> I played Whaley. Well, Jonah found himself in the middle of a storm because of his sin and because of his disobedience. So he can't stand up and, and, and claim his covenant and, and, you know, use his faith. That's not going to work. And because he wasn't willing to repent, the best advice he could give those sailors, you remember, is throw me overboard and the rest of y'all will be okay. So they did. They, th they reluctantly, but they threw him overboard. I don't know what he was thinking. He probably think, well, maybe, maybe I can, you know, ride a log into shore and get there in five or six days. But a great fish came along and swallowed him. And this ain't, this ain't, you know, sometimes the kids come out of Sunday school and they'll have, you know, Jonah in the whale. And you'll see him with a big smile on his face sitting in the whale. The fish has got his mouth open. He's sitting there smiling. That's not how it was. You read it. Jonah said, I'm in hell. Swallowed alive. He said, I'm in hell. Well, when Jonah repented, then he got delivered. When he re so in his case, in his case, his problem was, was because of sin. You remember Jesus told a man, he said, go and sin no more. 
Lest the worst thing come on you. Raised up a man that was, you know, it was a notable miracle. But the implication was, no, your problem was because of sin. So go and sin no more. A lot, a lot, too many scriptures along these lines. Amen. Now, just to kind of give you an example of some of these things, let, let me read you a couple of stories because I think these help us. And then and these are a lot longer than this, but they're real in concise form. And if I tell them, it'd take me the rest of the time just to tell one story, but I'll just read this from, this from Brother Hagin. He says, I remember a dear, precious saint of God. You know, he quotes the scripture, has the Lord delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice. Everybody say that. To obey is better than sacrifice. He says, I remember a dear, precious saint of God. She was saved and filled with the Holy Ghost. It was a joy to sit down and talk to her about the things of God. I don't know how many times over a period of several years I prayed for this, that dear woman for healing. I could help her momentarily, but I never could get her completely healed. She'd be all right for a little while, and then she would lose it. I wondered why she had been in such bad health for so many years. She was 80 years old, and for many years she had never really lived. Sickness and disease had incapacitated her. One day while standing over her bedside, she said, I never did do what God asked me to do. I wasn't willing. God called me to be a missionary when I was 12 years old. She loved the Lord, but she was never willing to obey him. She was never willing to do what he wanted her to do. That hindered the flow of God's healing power. I, that, notice what he said. That hindered the flow of God's healing power. I understood it all then. Matter of fact, I know in the story, she, she was at camp, like youth camp. And at and it, and it, youth camp, you know, God called her to be a missionary. And she knew God called her, but she never did obey that calling. She's not living out in gross sin, horrible sin. She's just not obeying the call. You see, disobedience opens the door to the enemy. Satan has a right to come in if the door is open. I've heard people talk about what it costs to serve God. It doesn't cost to go all out. It pays. But it will cost you to disobey. It will cost you not, not to be in the will of God. It will cost you heartache and sadness. It will cost you sickness and disease. It will cost you money. Sometimes it will cost you premature death. If there is something you need to deal with, deal with it. If there's something that's hindering the healing flow, get it unstopped. Be willing to do anything God wants you to do. Well, that's good advice. Can you say amen? Another story along those lines. See, this book is filled with scriptures on faith and healing and confession and standing on the word, but you got to get this in too. I remember praying for a 16-year-old girl who had a venereal disease. You know, she, she got saved and filled with the Holy Ghost, but, 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 but she had gotten involved with all kinds of sin and sexual immorality. At 16, the doctors wanted to take out her female organs. They were damaged. Of course, if those organs were removed, she never could become a mother. And she stood in the prayer line. The Spirit of God said to me, we just read the scripture, fools because of their iniquities, because of their transgressions are afflicted. Say to her, now he's just doing what the Spirit of God said to say. Say to her, confess I'm that fool and you'll be healed. So I spoke that out to her. I said, the Bible says that fools because of their iniquities and transgressions are afflicted. Confess that you are that fool and you'll be healed. I never laid hands on her. She threw her hands up and said, I'm that fool. And she said it over and over and again. She was instantly healed and never had to have that operation. In the process of time, she got married and became a mother. Ever since I've been saved, I've had to go to God and say, I've been a fool. I've acted foolishly. Forgive me. And thank God he did. If you've never done that, you probably need to start right now. <laughs> Amen. Another story along those lines. This, this one's very interesting. I, I'm, I'm not going to read all of these. We're running out of time. But, you, you know, on a couple of occasions, he talks about people that he laid hands on. One of them's parents, you know, and of course, parents have authority over their children. And so, you know, little children can't use their faith. It's, when they get to a certain age, they have to develop and use their faith. Mom and daddy's faith won't work anymore. They got to use their own faith. But this is like an eight-year-old girl, and she, she, was, she was not right at all, you know, just, just, just mentally challenged. And Brother Hagin laid hands on her, and, and, and she was much, much better. Much better. But, she, but she's about 70%, but not totally. And, and she was getting a little better, and, a little, and her parents, who were, who, were, who were preachers, backslid. And when they backslid, the little girl lost all her healing. And he tells story about, stories about people that, that they weren't instantly totally healed, but they, uh, I mean, if, if, you're, if you're really bad and you're 70% better, that's pretty good, ain't it? 
He said, you'd see them get a little better, a little better, but then, but then as they were getting better and better, they just, and he said, I saw that over and over again. They, they just lost everything because they got out and walked away from God. Years ago, I was ministering at a youth camp. Amen. In California, I received an emergency call. The voice on the other end said, Brother Hagin, do you remember Gary? I did. The man was talking about his oldest boy. He was just nine years old. Well, he said he had a sore throat and we prayed for it, but it got worse. We carried him to the doctor and the doctor said the infection went to his kidneys. Now his kidneys, kidneys have stopped functioning. The doctor said he will be dead in a matter of minutes. Dead in a matter of minutes. He is in intensive care and we want you to agree with us. We believe that Gary will live and not die. I said, I believe you, with you that he will live and not die. I was at this youth camp for several weeks before I left, I received a reel-to-reel -reel tape according, recorded in the mail. On it, the man said to me, Brother Hagen, they would only let me in the intensive care unit for five minutes a day. I would say to Gary, you lie there and say, himself took my infirmities and bear my sicknesses. I will live and not die. This little fellow said that over and over again for two days and two nights. Not just once or twice, not just 10 or 15 times, not 100 times, but thousands and thousands of times. This little nine-year-old said that over and over and over again. Suddenly he was all right. We just brought Gary home and he wants to say something to you. Then I heard Brother Gary say, Brother Hagen, I want to thank you for bringing the truth to me. Dad has already told you, but I must have said those words over 10,000 times each night. The doctors couldn't understand how that little boy had lived, but he did. God's word works. Amen. And then the next page of this book quotes the scripture. You are made whole of your sin Thou art made whole, sin no more, lest a worse thing come upon you. When Gary, the little nine-year-old boy, when he was 15 or 16 years old, he left home. He got away from God and became, got involved in the hippie movement. He actually denounced God. And that same kidney trouble that he was healed of as a nine-year-old boy came back on him. I went to Dallas to preach and Gary came to my meeting. He wasn't right with God. I knew he wasn't right. He tried to fake it, but he didn't fool me a bit. He was 17 or 18 years old at the time. I said to him, no, I'm not going to pray for you. You're not going to get healed under the present conditions because you're just faking it. You haven't made things right with God. So he admitted I was right. He said, you told the truth about it. I haven't. There are a lot of things in me that should not be in me. I'm not right with God. And I know I'm not right with God. I know I'm not right, but I don't want to die. And the doctor said, I'm going to die. They say, I haven't got much longer to live. I said, well, you need to get things lined up with God. But Gary refused to do that until he got right down on death's door. It cost him his life. I'm glad he did get back into, back into fellowship with God during the last few minutes of his life. He died praising God. But if he had done that six months ahead of time, he would have been healed. It's important to walk with God. God doesn't put on any half price sales. It's all or nothing with God. Make Jesus your Lord. Let him dominate your life and purpose to walk with him. Well, that, that's, that's very sobering, but very interesting, isn't it? Amen. Amen. So, let's not in this modern day age, I, I, like I said, I, 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 I consider myself top of the list. I don't mean it. I mean, just, just as far as that I preach it a lot on grace, but let's not get overbalanced the wrong way. And then we said that unforgiveness is a major blessing blocker. You know, if Jesus teaching on faith, and then in Mark eleven twenty five 25, it says, but if you have King James says, if you have aught against any, aught means anything down to zero. And so sometimes it means aught is, is old, old English is A-U-G-H-T, O-U-G-H-T, but, but aught as it's used there means, you could translate that if you have any little thing. In other words, so modern range translations would say, if you have anything against anyone, anything but here's the way Christians read it. And when you stand praying, if you have great big things against anyone, I mean, if you hate their guts and you detest them, then you know you should forgive. And I go, oh, that's right, boy. I mean, you know, yeah, they, they really did me dirty and it's a big deal. So I've I got a big grudge against them. But, you know, I don't pay no attention to these little things. I mean, I, I hear their name and I bad mouth them and I poor mouth them and I talk bad about them. And I go, ah, I can't stand that person. And, you know, it's just, you know and I talk bad about them and, you know, I, I don't hate them, but I'm mad at them. I'm hurt at them. Any little thing will stop your prayer. Any, any unforgiveness. 
You know, in the natural, there's some poisons that it doesn't matter whether you eat a teaspoonful of it or it just barely touches your tongue. It will kill you. It is so deadly. Unforgiveness is so deadly, it doesn't have to be a big thing, just a little bitty thing. Amen. If you have ought against any, if you have ought against any, if you have ought against any, praise God. Amen. Little grudges, little, little mad and angry. Don't hate them, but you're mad at them, offended, hurt at them. These little things are still unforgiveness. So, so why be sick? Why be defeated? Why be broke? Why, why be in poor health? Why, why be unable to overcome? Why, why even die prematurely, possibly, over an ought offense? Amen. And, and we said, you know, then our words are important. You can't use it. This is a big blessing that blocker that a lot of people ignore, but the Bible has a lot to say about it. But you, you can't be unkind and unloving, especially with your words and talk bad about others. A lot of times the reason we're being unkind with our words and judgmental and critical and, is because we have that little thing against them. Not the only reason. Sometimes it's just envy or jealousy, but that's one of the major reasons that people talk bad about others. But that will, those will block your life. And, 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 and in reality, in everyday life, many Christians, many Christians, bless their hearts. I mean, you know, they go to church. They'd rather be caught dead than drinking a drop of alcohol or smoking a cigarette. But on a regular basis, they're expressing their criticism toward other people, gossiping about other people, saying unkind things about other people, being unloving, unkind, critical, judgmental. Their, their life is just strife-filled. That's just everyday life. Ah, yeah, blah, 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 grumbling, griping. I was watching somebody on Facebook the other day. And, you know, they, they uh, kind of helped me a little bit, to tell you the truth, because I used to come to church here. They don't come anymore, but they, they criticize the doctor. They criticize the gas station attendant. They criticize everybody's against that. They, everybody they come in contact with, they're all messed up and they're all wrong. And I thought, you know, the constant in all these situations is you. <laughs> but I'm just talking about it's just everyday normal life for them to be mad at somebody and talk about somebody and criticize somebody and, and, and you know, and things Jesus said not to do and so forth. And, and then they don't, they don't make the connection and don't realize whether they're not able to walk in God's best and so forth. But a fourth thing, because even though most of that was brand new, let me give you the fourth thing, okay? Because we didn't mention this at all Sunday. But an, another great big blessing blocker is doubt, fear, and unbelief. You know that one, don't you? But I'm going to show you something about it. Doubt, fear, and unbelief. Mark 11, 23 for verily I say unto you, whosoever shall say unto this mountain, Be thou removed, and be thou cast into the sea, and shall not doubt in his heart. So if you doubt in your heart, the confession won't work. If you doubt in your heart, you can't move mountains. You know, James 1, 6 says, But let him ask in faith with, with no doubting. You know, I think it, some translations say without wavering, but the word there means you must not doubt at all. Everybody say you must not doubt. <laughs> at all. So, 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 you know, lots of scriptures about pray believing. And, and lots of scriptures about you can't pray in unbelief. We, we know that. Many, many scriptures. But here, here's what I want you to see in the little time we have left. Little faith, listen carefully. Little faith is not 60% faith and 40% unbelief. And great faith is not 90% faith and 10% unbelief. Unbelief or doubt. If you have any doubt, it will not work. If we have any doubt, faith to receive the promises, faith to overcome and do whatever it is God's leading you to do and calling you to do, faith to exercise your authority, to rebuke a storm, must be 100% faith without any doubt or it will not work. In Matthew 17, you can, you can put it up for us, Matthew. Matthew 17, 14 through 17. Jesus, you know, the disciples, a man came to Jesus. I'm going to tell you the story. Well, let me read it to you. And when they had come down to the mountain, a man came to him, kneeling down to him and saying, Lord, have mercy on my son, for he is an epileptic and suffers severely. He often falls into the fire and often into the water. I brought him to your disciples, but they could not cure him. Next verse. Then Jesus answered and said, Oh, faithless and perverse generation. Now that's addressed to his, to his disciples as much as to the man. Had Jesus given them, hit them authority to cast out devils? Yes. Had Jesus given them the authority to cast out devils? Yes. yes, and they had done it. 
It wasn't a lack of power. It, would, it wasn't that they didn't have the ability to cast out the devil. It's because of faith, a lack of faith. We don't, next, next verse, next verse, Jesus delivered the man. The disciples said, why couldn't we cast him out? Next verse. So Jesus said, because of your unbelief, because you doubted. He said, you could not cast this devil out because of unbelief. Well, is, does unbelief stop the power of God? Jesus in his own hum, hometown could do no mighty works because of their unbelief, because of their doubt. Doubt will rob you of the blessings of God. You know that. But, but the point I want you to see is, is this. Faith, faith always works a hundred million times out of a hundred million times as long as you don't have the unforgiveness or the, or the thing blocking it. It always works. And it doesn't take but a little grain of faith to move mountains. But it has to be pure. It has to be undiluted. It has to be 100% faith and no doubt whatsoever. That's why I tell people when it comes to yourself and especially when it comes to praying for other people, go blowing into the hospital room and they're two hours away from dying and, you know, or two weeks away from dying or maybe two months even and you're just going to pray, you pray your, and, then, and you blow out of there and nothing happens and they die because they don't believe. And unless it's a gift of the Spirit, you know, even then it still matters. They got to hook up with you. They got to, what can you believe? Because if you'll find something that they can honestly and truly believe, it will work. Amen. Hallelujah. Keith Moore one time ran across a man that was in that kind of condition. And, and you know, it was obvious to him the man just couldn't believe. But he, but, but he said to the man, he just kept talking with him, talking with him. You know, you locate people when you talk to him. And finally he said to the man, he said, do you believe that I can pray for you and you'll get a little, just a little bit better? And the man said, I can believe that. Now we got something to work with. And you know what happened? The man got a little better. And he said, do you believe if I pray for you again, you, you can get a, a little better from here? And he just kept doing that and kept doing it until the man was totally raised up. Amen. Glory to God. I said, glory to God. So I always tell people jokingly, I say, if I can't believe God for two million, I'll settle for one. Amen. Because listen, do you have on a red shirt? You know immediately whether you have on a red shirt or not. Can you believe God for, for $500,000 to buy a new house? Well, no, really, I can't. Somebody might say, you know. But can you believe God that he'll help you get a good down payment, you know, because you need a good down payment of, of seven or 8000 or whatever that you need and help you find a good deal and help you find a comfortable home and, and give you the ability to make your payments on time and even help you to, to pay that house off early? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I can believe that. Then believe right there. And don't doubt. Whatever you can believe for without any doubt whatsoever, that's where faith will work. So, so here's some, you, you with me? You all right? Here, here's, here's Andrew Womack on Matthew 17, 20. Jesus didn't say the reason they couldn't cast the demon out was because they didn't have any faith. They did have faith. That, that's why they were confused and asked the question. They had cast out demons before and expected positive results, but they didn't get them. It is possible to have faith but not see that faith produce the desired results because doubt, unbelief, negates or counteracts faith. So sometimes people do believe, but, but they doubt at the same time. And that's what James says, no, no doubting, no wavering. It's like hitching a horse to a heavy weight. The horse can move the weight if there isn't a counterbalancing force, but if you hitch another horse to the opposite side and have it pull the opposite direction at the same time, tremendous force will be exerted, but the weight won't move because of the opposing force. It doesn't take great faith to see miracles, just pure faith without the opposing force of doubt and unbelief. Peter walked on the water to go to Jesus. He had faith. Amen. But, but, when he, but when he began to doubt, he sank. He, he got out there with faith, but now he began to sink because now he had faith and doubt. Their faith was negated. It's like the children of Israel. Their faith was negated by their unbelief. Glory to God. There are three main categories of unbelief. Unbelief from ignorance, unbelief from wrong doctrine or knowledge, and, and natural unbelief. By natural unbelief, he just means you, you, you're not persuaded to believe. You know it's God's word, but you, your senses just overwhelm you. The first two types of unbelief can be countered through revelation knowledge of the scriptures. The natural unbelief can only be dealt with through prayer and fasting. Read verse number 21. 
This is really good. However, this kind does not go out except by prayer and fasting. This demon, no. This kind of unbelief. Why can't we cast out the demon? Because of unbelief. This kind of unbelief. By prayer and fasting, by prayer and fasting. Well, wait a minute, wait a minute. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. I'd say this a little bit different than Andrew. This is great. But you know, unbelief from ignorance comes by knowledge of the word of God. Unbelief from wrong doctrine, you know, you, know, you, you got some kind of, that comes by knowledge of the word of God. But unbelief, this kind of unbelief, because you're trying to believe, but you're just, just oh, that demon's, this one's really hairy. You know, it's, it's scary. That, 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 that mountain is so big this time. And your senses say, it's not so, it's not so, it's not so, it's not so. You're not healed, you're not healed, you're not healed. You're not going to get that need met. You're not going to get that need met. No, I'd say that kind of unbelief comes out by revelation light. Or revel what we normally just say, revelation knowledge. And how do you get revelation knowledge? I noticed today, this was, this was cool, Margaret. Commentary after commentary, prayer and fasting, they talked about, they equated that to spending time in prayer with God, studying the Word of God, meditating in the Word of God, Aha, this kind. How do you get rid of unbelief? You get into the Word of God. You, you know, you, you can fast TV. You can fast. See, instead, instead of being out, nothing wrong going fishing, I fished all night long with my, my grandson Monday night, the other one, sorry, bud. I knew you had to work. F fished all night long. Nothing wrong with that, but... but, but this natural world, if this, that's all you do is natural things, some people just hear, the, they hear somebody preach once or twice or three times a month and they, they read a few scriptures once every two, 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 two or three times a week and pray 10 minutes a week. No, no, no. When, when you get before the Lord and you got your Bible open and you're studying the Word of God and you're meditating in the Word of God and you're reading the Word of God, don't you see how that brings revelation light? And, and, and so when something shows up, then, then, then you know, what you feel, feel, what you see, what you taste, what you touch, that won't overwhelm you because this will be so big in you. Glory to God. Amen. So you're, 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 you're not just, you, you know, instead of just sitting there relaxing, nothing wrong with that. But, but when I was dying of cancer, I, I, you know, I'd come home every afternoon and I'd, I'd relax. I'd, I worked every day, but I'd come home a little early, 3.30, and I'd, I'd rest. But I didn't watch TV necessarily from 3.30 to 11. I spent an hour or two in the scriptures. I'm fasting, I'm fasting TV and praying and reading and studying and hearing from God and putting the word before my eyes. And, and that causes the doubt to go. The un There's no wavering. That's why I was so full of the word of God. I told that doctor, they just laughed. I told that doctor, I said, you can pump me full of mayonnaise. I don't care. It'll work. Hallelujah. Are you listening? Amen. Mm. If you just live in the natural world all the time, you'll just be influenced by your senses. But if you spend time in the Word, in prayer, and study, and Bible, Bible meditation, you'll develop the sixth sense of faith. And then you won't be so persuaded by all those other things. You'll be moved by the Word. Glory to God. I said, Glory to God. I said, Glory to God. Stand up with me. Stand up with me. Amen. So faith must be pure, undiluted, with no doubting. And listen, here's what I want. I want to say one more thing to you. Israel. If you can't believe for healing, because all of a sudden something happens suddenly and it's very serious, or there's a lot of pain involved, or maybe it's in sort of, sort of, sort of, some sort of terminal disease, and you know you just can't believe for it. Then believe God that you can be helped through what God will do through medicine and doctors. God is your source. And, and I don't understand because people, people will almost say, well, you know, I'll get tired of this a little bit. Look, look, look. When it comes to healing, 99 times out of 100, I've been healed straight from the power of God over some very serious things. On occasion, two or three times in my life, doctors helped me, praise God. But I, didn't, but I just didn't say, well, I didn't get it from God, so just forget. No, no, I went to the doctors in faith. In faith. Amen. 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 But, 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 but listen, if you know in your heart of hearts, if you know, no, I, I, I'm just not there right now. I do believe, I believe in healing with all my heart, but there's some doubt here because I'm in pain, because of the seriousness, because this, because I'm, this snuck up on me for whatever reason, then, then go to the doctor, but go in faith. 
Because here, here's people that will look down on Christians for that and I'll say, did you buy your $600,000 home with cash? No, I'm paying. Why didn't you buy it with cash? Don't you believe in prosperity? <laughs> if you had perfect faith, you could. Uh, you could. They say, well, no, you know, but, but God helped me get this house. He led me to it. He got me a tremendous deal and he's helping me make the payments and, and I even paid it off early. Praise God. They don't criticize somebody because they're doing the same thing medically, so to speak. You follow me? Brother, hey, Brother Copeland recently had a pacemaker put in. He said, I told God, he said, I, he said, I just believe you. He said, God said, no, you're too far behind the curve. So he had to put in. And the, he had a pacemaker that, did, that also did the defibrillation. defibrillation. Now, now, you know, now he's got time and he worked on it and did things in the natural and did things in the spiritual, of course, and they turned the defibrillator off because he doesn't need it anymore. Certainly had things like that happen in my life. But, but, but do you get that? So, 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 so if all of a sudden you're just overwhelmed, caught off guard, in a lot of pain, in an emergency situation where the doctor says, son, we've we got to set your lug in the next five minutes. If you don't, you're going to lose it. We're going to have to amputate it. Well, then believe God. And if not, let the doctor set your leg, but believe he'll set it right. You understand what I'm saying? So either, either find where you can hook up to and give 100% faith with no doubt, or, or, and only, this is between you and God. You don't have to ask me questions. I can't tell you what to do. You get into the Word of God and you stay in it day and night, 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 day and night until you have no doubt whatsoever. Brother Hagin, toward the end of his life, when, well, you know, he, he was having a situation where it wasn't getting results. And, and you know, this, wasn't, this wasn't six months. This wasn't a year and a half down the road. This was, this was just over a period of 18 hours, something like that, you know. He said, I got up the next morning. He said, he said I was in up such pain. He said, I started calling my, a doctor on my board of trustees. He said, because you know when you're in pain, you can't take it so, much, so long. But sometimes people hear somebody like Brother Copeland or Brother Hagen or Earl Roberts, and they think you're supposed to stay in pain for the next 16 and a half years. No, get results or go get help. But go in faith. Go in faith. Find where you can believe 100%. You got, say, I got it. If you don't say it real strong, then I'm going to keep preaching. Say, I got it. Oh. <laughs> well, then you go home. <laughs> hey, we love you. We love you. We love you. Did you get anything out of that? Yeah. Amen. God bless you. You're dismissed. Praise you, Lord Jesus. Praise you, Lord Jesus.